Hello and welcome back to the PaleoCast Gaming Network, where today we're going to do something a little bit different and take a look at Skyrim. Now the virtual wilderness of Skyrim famously features a number of mythical fantasy creatures living alongside extinct animals like cave bears and saber tooths and woolly mammoths. And I think this makes it the perfect setting to discuss something that I get asked about all the time. How much have fossils inspired mythology and folklore? So interestingly, the majority of the mammoth herds you encounter in Skyrim are domesticated, which I don't think we've actually seen in any of the games we've previously looked at. You'll notice right away that they have four tusks instead of two. Not a complaint, I just I have to point it out, and I, I quite like it design-wise. And yeah, mammoths are super interesting, because whilst the majority of them died out 10,000 years ago from habitat loss and human hunting, a handful survived for like another 6,000 years on an isolated island off the coast of Siberia. By the time mammoths were completely extinct, the pyramids in Egypt were already a couple hundred years old. In addition to these living virtual mammoths, we can also find pretty semi-decent 3D models of their skeletons just littered across the countryside, including a whole mammoth graveyard just a little ways north from here, so I think that's what we're going to do next. So this is, you know, it's kind of grim, but we've actually found mammoth fossils in these mass assemblages just like this all over the world, most famously the Berelek Mammoth Graveyard in Siberia. Now sites like this are super debatable. Some people argue that mammoth graveyards form when rivers carrying deposit remains in the same place over time, whereas others argue that early humans may have regularly hunted and ambushed mammoths in the same area, resulting in their build-up as well. And there's, there's fairly decent evidence for both arguments, but you'll notice that the, the point I'm getting at here is that despite its name, this idea of an elephant graveyard, the notion that modern elephants instinctively return to the same place to die, that wasn't considered here, and it's never been proven or observed in nature at all. This is an example of where a myth has potentially been inspired by fossils, in this case, these mass assemblages we've been talking about. Now, very famously, it's been suggested since the 40s that the Cyclops was inspired by the discovery of fossil elephant skulls in ancient Greece, with people mistaking the very central nasal cavity for a single eye socket. And likewise, it's also been suggested that the giant bones of mammoths may have inspired all sorts of various giant monsters throughout Native American lore, such as the aquatic horned water beasts in the lore of the Abenakis, who live in Atlantic Canada and parts of New England, who may have been inspired by fossil tusks and vertebrae from woolly mammoths turning up in riverbeds. Stuff like this is lovely to think about, but unfortunately it's really difficult to prove. Personally, I think it comes down to the fact that there have been countless individuals around the world who were extremely familiar with the biology of the animals that lived in their time and place hundreds or even thousands of years ago, so the notion that they wouldn't recognise a fossil bone or even a fossil footprint as having once belonged to a now long gone creature it's just ridiculous, of course they would. But whether or not mythic creatures were inspired by, or reinforced by, or even connected to these discoveries, it's a little bit more speculative. So with that in mind, rather than staying with this too long, we're going to jump from a real ancient animal that has potentially inspired myth, to a fantasy creature that has been potentially inspired by the fossils of ancient animals. And in this game, there is a tendency for dragons to suddenly appear when you least want them to. I might be the first Skyrim player in history who genuinely wants a dragon to randomly turn up, and I guarantee you it's not going to happen. <laughs> so, we're going to have to find somewhere where we're kind of guaranteed to meet them. Dragon Tooth Crater. Yeah, let's go there. I, I can hear it, but I have no idea where it is. Oh, oh shoot, there it is. Are you going to come over here? That's super inconvenient of you. Ah, this would appear to be it. Oh! Spend all day waiting for a dragon and then two of them come at once. <laughs> yes, alright, alright. Oh, Christ. Alright, one sec. Jesus. <laughs> alright, let's get this over with. I see, the joy of this game is that once you actually defeat the dragons, yeah, you get the, you know, souls and whatnot, but you get to see their skeletons when you're done. <laughs> That's what we're trying to aim for here. Okay, I think if I press and pause, we're going to die. Ah. Oh. Hey, who's this? <laughs> Did you do this? 
Okay, attempt two. Da -da -dun, da -da -dun, da -da -dun, da -da -dun. Just hear my horse screaming in the background. Oh, oh no! <laughs> One thing I wanted to talk about was the wings and then faded through the floor. Alright, so we're going to do our best to talk about this skeleton. Unfortunately, the thing I really wanted to talk about, because Skyrim is a broken game, <laughs> has fallen through the floor. So I love this skeleton design. It's really stylized and cartoony, but once you get your eye in, you can actually start to recognize some bones that are probably inspired by real animals. The hips, for instance, are a bit of a mismatch of generic archosaurs. Archosaurs being the collective name for crocodiles and their many, many uh, relatives, and then pterosaurs and dinosaurs, including living birds as well. So that kind of makes sense. For instance, it actually has a really large ilium, so that's this bone here, with these really like well-defined grooves running through it. And they basically look like the same muscle depressions that you would find in a lot of archosaurs. It's got a really strange skull, like the coronoid process of the uh, lower jaw is really unusual. But what I love is you can literally see where the muscles for the lower jaw would attach. That's really good attention to detail. I love it. I also wouldn't be surprised if the majority of the skeleton was pneumatic. Basically, they'd have hollow bones, which it would use to breathe, um, which is how one birds breathe, and it would also keep it relatively lightweight to support an animal of this size, especially one that can fly, which is what I want to talk about next. Unfortunately, oh my god, that dragon is freaking me out. All right, so I've got a bit of a sneaky backup plan for how to demonstrate this. Um, but I think to do it, we kind of want to be out in the open, far away from a town. <laughs> <laughs> You'll see why in a minute. So in your arm you have a humerus, radius and ulna, and then all the little bones that make up your hands. But because we share a common ancestor, you can find the exact same bones in the arms of like every other mammal, including the flippers of whales and wings of bats, as well as in every bird, every reptile and amphibian, because we're all tetrapods. And the technical term for this is that these features are homologous, even though they look very different. On an embryonic level they've developed in more or less the same way. Now wings on the other hand, they've evolved multiple times in the history of life on Earth. Bats as you already mentioned, other tetrapods like uh, pterosaurs which are reptiles, birds obviously, but also insects like dragonflies, butterflies, bees, wasps have also converged on wings. Now we call this convergent evolution because obviously bats did not inherit their wings from birds, wingless mammals evolved first, and then eventually a group of mammals found wings again millions of years later. But because bats, birds, and also pterosaurs are tetrapods like us, they are again homologous. It's the same bones in a different arrangement to achieve the same goal. However, compared to the wings of, say, a dragonfly, though it's still, you know, convergent evolution, they're still providing flight, they're not homologous to bird or bat wings. They've developed through a completely different evolutionary route. That's not to say that we don't share a, you know, common ancestor with insects, we do. We just diverged an extremely long time ago. But anyway, that brings us to dragons. And I think this area should do us pretty well. There's no paths or anything like that. There's no villages. Hopefully we shouldn't be bothered by anyone. Let's do some mad science. Because we're on the PC version, we can use some sneaky console commands. And do this. <laughs> All right. And it's left us. Oh no, it's coming back. Okay, so as our new friend is demonstrating magnificently, the dragons in Skyrim also have wings that are modified from their forelimbs. If we were a biologist living in Skyrim, we might say that not only have they converged on wings, but they're homologous to other flying tetrapods like birds and bats and pterosaurs. And you can find dragons with this design in loads of other games. Uh, Dark Souls comes to mind, for instance, but in a game like um, Spyro or... I guess the Dungeons and Dragons monster manual? <laughs> Those dragons effectively have six limbs. They have their forelimbs, they have their hind limbs, and then a third set of like limbs, a set of wings on their back. This suggests to me that their wings must have evolved through a totally different route and are therefore not homologous to tetrapod wings. I hope that makes sense. I remember when I learned about this for the first time, we used like angel wings as like a reference, but I think this is a lot more um a lot more fun. Anyway, looking at them up close, the dragon wings in this game definitely remind me most of the wings of bats, since they form a membrane over each digit. That's actually why bat wings are so flexible, because if you can imagine, they're basically just big webbed leathery hands, which is super weird. 
It's actually not too unusual for an archosaur to converge on bat like rings as well, because dinosaurs like Yi Chi and Ambopteryx genuinely did have these leathery bat like wings. Oh, I guess since they came first, bats converged on their wings. That's weird. Um, now, we are pretty confident that those dinosaurs probably weren't able to fly, but I bring it up because those fossils weren't published until years after this game was released, or at least first released. That's a story for another time. What I'm getting at is that isn't it amazing that that wing design has been so popular for so many decades and it's only in the last like five or six years that we've found fossils that most closely resemble them. And that brings us to the crux of this video, the question that I get asked every time I do a visit to a school or work in a museum or catch up with family. Did dinosaur fossils inspire dragons? The short answer is... Uh, yeah. <laughs> the longer and much more helpful answer is, it sure would be neat. Well, <laughs> hello. <laughs> That's so funny. I've literally had that exact thing happen to me on fieldwork in Scotland before. That's so weird. Uh, anyway, in my opinion, it seems to stem from the fact that dragon myths have existed for many centuries, humans have been collecting fossils for many, many centuries, and dragons and fossils, they just share a superficial resemblance, and with that in mind it's very easy to retroactively look at fossils from our point in the present and suggest that there might be a connection. You might already know that in ancient China, early discoveries of dinosaurs and even mammal fossils were genuinely recorded and labelled as dragon bones. It's also been suggested that dinosaur fossil discoveries in ancient Rome and ancient Greece also coincide with early dragon myths as well. But on the other hand, in Scandinavian and Norse mythology, which is what Skyrim is really based on, dragons are very common, but dinosaur fossils are extremely rare in Scandinavia due to the aging composition of the rocks. So it doesn't always line up so neatly. But then again, they don't necessarily have to be dinosaur fossils. So I grew up in County Durham in the northeast of England, and our local dragon myth is of the Lampton Worm, this huge eel-like dragon that coiled itself around a hill near Sunderland. And if I remember correctly, the story goes that if you were to cut the dragon in half, it would sort of reconstitute itself until uh, a brave knight chopped the worm into many pieces and chucked them in the river Weir, where they flowed downstream and the dragon was sort of unable to reform. Now, County Durham is also built on a lot of carboniferous aged sediment. That's why there's so many coal mines where I grew up. And in the River Weir, which cuts through carboniferous sediment, you can find fossilized chunks of bark from extinct trees like Lepidodendron that actually kind of look like dragon scales. And now it would be amazing if all these things would align up, and I would love to tell you that that's how it all works, but we just can't know for certain. It's just a neat thing that we've noticed now, looking back on our history. So, you know, there's a couple great examples- Oh god! Jesus! So, <laughs> let me just deal with this. Yep, so there are saber-tooths in this game. We're gonna try and stay on topic for now, but maybe I'll do another video in the future where we talk about all the other animals that live here, because I don't think we've talked about cave bears before, and that could be fun. Anyway, the point I'm getting at is that it doesn't always line up so neatly. What are you? What are you doing? Aspiring mage. Oh, Hiya. Hello there. Hello. Didn't notice you come up. See, my grandfather was a wizard. After that, I thought I was turning into a wizard, too. <laughs> <laughs> Tell people about dragons. Hello. So, I've been trying to record this section now for far too long. I'm looking at my notes, it's only got like a paragraph left and I just keep getting attacked. So I've come home <laughs> to finish this last little part. One of the main arguments I see is that a lot of sort of early depictions of dinosaurs look a lot like mythical creatures. That sort of reinforces the idea, but what you gotta remember is that early paleo art is in fact inspired by artwork of dragons, that sort of scary biblical artwork that came before it. And I think that's why we find the recent monsterification of ancient animals in recent video games so interesting. Giving them these fantastical abilities or extra tusks or whatever it might be, and just putting them alongside fantasy creatures as well. We seem a little hell-bent on bringing dinosaurs more closer, sort of back to that mythic representation. And I often wonder, how does that change how people perceive ancient animals? This probably doesn't apply to our audience, but do the general public even see dinosaurs and other ancient animals as 
animals? Or do they just see them as monsters up there with dragons and trolls and whatever else it may be? I honestly don't know. I would love to know your thoughts though, by all means. Shoot off in the comments and let me know what you think. Thanks again for watching, and please do subscribe, and I will see you next time.